We are an independent um, 501c3 nonprofit organization formed within New York Law School. New York Law School very generously hosts us, gives us space, gives us some financial support to have one part-time um, staff member. But everything else that we do, we do for free. Or we do, we try to raise private funding. So to the degree any of you um, know of people who might want to be involved in this cause, who are willing to help donate, that's appreciated as well. What, what do we spend the money on? We often buy subway and train tickets for the young people that we meet because they have no way to travel into New York City to meet with the pro bono lawyers. Um, we also have two part-time staff attorneys, and I've been raising their money independently and privately. Um, we are up to over 350 cases, and so our ability to help you do this pro bono work really depends in part on having some staff support. Um, I am not compensated, just so everyone's clear about this. This is my pro bono work on top of being a full-time professor here at New York Law School. So, pitch for making a donation. This is a free training. Um, we are not, at this point, offering CLE credit, although we, are, we didn't have staff available to do that. We're going to look into whether we can retroactively offer it. We did make a suggested request of a donation of $240 for the trainings if you have the means. Otherwise, we're just glad that you're here, that your heart is moving you, your intellect is inspired to see how can you train and use your skills to represent immigrant child migrants. Well, let's take a, a basic introduction to make sure you know how the children are arriving at the United States. Um, you've been watching the news, the majority of the children, this is the image that you may have seen. This is an image taken from a, a documentary um, about children traveling the train through Mexico. They travel on top of the train, it's very dangerous. The train has a nickname, La Bestia, the, the beast, right? And children um, get across the Guatemalan border into Mexico. They may have traveled by bus or walked or been transported by smugglers into the Mexican frontier. Every year, Mexico deports thousands and thousands of these children back to El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and even to Ecuador. Um, the, the children are migrating in the region, both north and south. Countries such as uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Costa Rica, Colombia um, have also reported receiving child migrants. But in the recent months, the numbers have exponentially grown. So when we began this project in 2006, there were less than about 4,000 children apprehended on our southern border. Then in 2010, it was up to about 8,000. 2012, it was 16,000. 2013, 24,000. And the estimate for this year so far, that the last number I saw reported by Customs and Border Protection, 54,000 children. Now, let's pause. That's tremendous. It's a huge number of children, primarily coming from three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. But there's also Mexican children trying to come. They do not successfully navigate our border in the majority of situations because under our um, treaty agreements with both Canada and Mexico, we can push children back into those two countries. We have an understanding with the Mexican government that children from Mexico will be taken care of with appropriate child management authority. Advocates are very skeptical about that, and there have been Mexican children who have arrived at the border and been able to articulate a fear of persecution or violence that does allow them to also enter the United States. So the majority of the children that we're talking about in our project have arrived without documents. They have not come with visas. They've been assisted by family members or by professional smugglers. And often their journey has taken weeks, if not months. Another group of children potentially that we might see in our work are children who arrive by sea. This is an image, obviously, of people in the Caribbean. Um, we've had different periods in time in the Caribbean where both people from Haiti and the Dominican Republic or Cuba have been desperate to leave their country situation and they often take to the water. 
This is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, Australia receives children arriving by sea, and I just spoke at a conference in Italy where they are having 2,400 people a day arriving in Sicily. So I think it's important that we understand that um, adults and children will take desperate measures to flee desperate situations. This is another image that maybe comes to your mind when you think of immigration law. You think of someone walking across the Texas, Arizona, or California frontier. And the question I have for you is, who is this man holding the hand of these children? It could be the children's father, bringing them to join him, perhaps, for his life and his work in the United States. It could be that this man is an uncle, or an older brother, or a cousin. But more likely, this man is a professional smuggler. And the name that you'll hear the ch children use in Spanish is they'll say coyote. Coyote meaning the wily one, the clever one, the smart one. It's also the professional term for people who smuggle children. The model of smuggling has changed. And I don't have, you know, I have not interviewed any smugglers. But interviewing the children as we have, what we've learned is more and more often the smugglers are leaving the children right at the frontier. They're not actually trying to bring them into the United States because they know that if they tell the children to walk to the Border Patrol Station um, in Hildago, in Arizona, in California, that the Border Patrol will process them. And if they are not Mexican nationals, the, there's no way to immediately repatriate those children safely back to Salvador, Honduras, or Guatemala. So the smugglers now have a business model of just bringing the children to the frontier. Now that's not true in every case. Over the past several years, we've interviewed children who were held in locked houses in the United States until family members paid a double fee. So their families are told one fee for the smuggler to bring them to the United States, then the children are held locked in a house. Um, they often are, are asked to perforce labor in that house. It might be cooking, it might be cleaning, doing laundry. And sadly, many of the people have been victimized sexually. Now, this is something you need to be sensitive to throughout the work we're about to talk about. You are meeting children who have already probably been interviewed a number of times by government officials. They were interviewed by Border Patrol when they were arrested. They were interviewed by social work screeners or professionals when they were held and detained by immigration through the Department of Health and Human Services. We have another branch of government that detains them. They were probably interviewed again wherever they were located in a detention center. They might have had a physical exam and been interviewed by a doctor and a physician. And then they are released to family members, uh, friends of family, uh, grandparents, and their family members may have asked them again about their journey. Then they meet Safe Passage Project at the court, and we're asking them again. To expect the child to trust you immediately and tell you intimate details about the terrible things that happen on the journey is um, something you should not expect. You should expect you're going to need time to build trust with your client, as you would in any client situation. But please be sensitive to the fact that these children have had a tough journey. And often, the smugglers have threatened them, saying, don't you tell. Don't tell. If you tell, I'll find you. And they're, they're, the median age of these children is 14. That's the median. That means many are younger. Catholic Charities, which represents the children and screens them in the detention centers in Westchester. There are 350 children, approximately, in detention right now in Westchester County. And they have been for a number of years. The rumor is that the detention space in New York is going to increase to 1,200 beds, maybe even more. Um, we see the children in our project after they've been released from detention. The Catholic Charities has been working with uh, Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, and that hospital's physicians that seen many of these children tells us, this number is going to be a little bit shocking, that 70 to perhaps 80% of the girls have been sexually assaulted in, on the journey. Here's another image, doesn't happen as often, and that is a child who smuggled into the United States with travel documents. The United States forensic detail on our passports has our children's pictures, but does not have any fingerprinting or forensic detail. So another technique some smugglers use is they will take the passports or permanent resident documents of children and 
bring children who are similar age or appearance um, into the United States using that child's false documents. So there are times where Safe Passage Project meets children who have lived in the United States for a long time who have no papers, who have no documents, because when they originally entered, they might have entered on a legal document, a tourist visa, perhaps with their family, or they were smuggled as some other identity. And we're meeting those children either because they're now in deportation proceedings or through one of the other organizations that we sometimes partner with. We have a, a very uh, rich relationship with a high school in Washington Heights. Um, called Wheels. It's a really remarkable educational opportunity in the public school system and we partner with them to offer legal services to the children that self-identify and who teachers sometimes identify, the school counselors. So for example, in the last two years we've helped more than 25 children out of 27 we interviewed get permanent resident status in that one high school. Um, we are asked all the time by other social work organizations in the city and other organizations that do immigration work, will we take on their children cases? We are a specialist in this area. At the present time, we can't. We don't have the capacity because our priority is the immigration court, the children in deportation proceedings. However, we're building capacity with you. By you coming to this training today and being willing to take on representation of these children, it makes us able to say yes to more children. And hopefully the idea is you'll begin with one case and then you'll take another and take another and it'll become a regular part of your pro bono work and you'll become an export, expert and hopefully reach out to your law school classmates and friends and neighbors and colleagues and say let's do a case together. And why is this so important? Well because even though these children are children and is defined as such under the immigration law they have no right to free counsel at the current time. So a lawsuit was filed um, about two weeks ago by the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Immigration Council, which is a, f a foundation wing of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, joined by the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and Public Counsel in Los Angeles, which is rather like a private legal aid organization. We cooperated with um, the, the ACLU to help identify some of the plaintiff children. Why does the federal government put children in deportation proceedings and then not provide them free counsel? Well that is because um, there's a provision in the immigration law that says at no expense to the government. Now litigation occurred a couple of years ago for the mentally ill and the federal court ruled that people who are mentally incompetent must be provided counsel. So that's good news. I do expect that sometime in the next two years, maybe three years, that litigation will finally resolve that under the due process clause of the Constitution and the guarantee of um, access to counsel, these children should be appointed counsel at federal expense. There is also a bill pending in Congress. It was introduced by New York's own Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, and we're a supporter of that bill. He is a representative from um, I think it's Queens and Brooklyn, right? And um, he has bipartisan support actually in that bill. And if you are interested in doing some community advocacy or political advocacy, you might think about advocating behind that bill. We really do need a federal legal aid system for children. There's no details in the legislation though of how it might work. So it's possible that one of the models will be similar to panel attorneys here in New York. So it could be that if you train today and become knowledgeable in this field, maybe later you'll be able to qualify to be someone who can receive federal funding. As you might be familiar with the, the CJA, the Criminal Justice Act, I have that right, in, in federal criminal court, you can be a qualified attorney to receive reimbursement for your representation. That very may well be the model that immigration court proceeds in the future. So training today to do this pro bono work may also perhaps one day be a source of paid work by the federal government. Okay, I noticed some people are taking notes and of course you're welcome to do that. These um, materials are, and the definitions and all this, these are all available on our website in our SIDGE manual. Right, so you know what, I really want you to just relax this morning and, and I know we're talking about a very serious topic, but don't feel like you have to take it all down because it's all there for you. All right, so very, very right away we see that there's some different definitions. In the immigration law, child is someone who's under 21. 
That's very different than our state law when we think of a, a minor as being under 18. But a juvenile, which is a term of art in the immigration law, is someone who's under 18. And wh why that's relevant is that the immigration court has special procedures, or they're supposed to follow special procedures for someone who's a juvenile, but not necessarily for everyone who's a child. And then a minor is a term they use really to just release people from certain forensic testing, fingerprint testing, and that's someone who's under 14. So like any field of law, tax law, states law, states vary, et cetera, you're going to have definitional terms of art. What we tend to use as the main term that we use is this one, unaccompanied alien child. And the reason we use this um, language of unaccompanied alien child is the, tra the trafficking victims protection reauthorization. reauthorization act, sorry, TVPRA, that's what we all call it, um, gave some special protections to children who are apprehended at the border under the age of 18 who don't already have legal status in the United States and who are not with a parent or legal guardian at the time of their apprehension. That designation as the child as an unaccompanied alien child means that they're going to be able for certain procedures throughout their immigration process that are more generous and are tailored to the needs of children. All right? Um, so we do meet children over the age of 18 but under the age of 21 and we do assist them as well. There are a few organizations in the city who don't help children over the age of 17 and a half. So in part, we're often asked to take those cases too because um, it's the way their funding went under this particular statute. Once a kid is over 17 and a half, they feel like they can't help them. All right, again, I already gave you some numbers. It's over 50,000 already this year. 12% of the New York court docket are children's cases. So if you've never been to immigration court, um, it might look a little bit to you like any other really busy administrative type court, like a housing court or family court, where there's a lot of people in the hallways. The court administrator, by the way, the court building's just two blocks away here from the school. It's at 26 Federal Plaza. We'll see a slide on that. And it, in the hallways, the court administrator tells, tells me most mornings more than 3,000 people are going through those hallways. So it's people appearing for their hearings, people with their family members, people um, bringing in children. The court tried to take all the children's cases and put them on five special dockets. They call them the juvenile dockets. Sadly, though, there are so many children's cases that they're now spread throughout all the regular immigration removal hearings. If you're volunteering with Safe Passage Project, we prioritize the cases coming through the juvenile docket with Judge Patricia Rowan. And if you are assigned a case that's with another judge who sent the case to Safe Passage Project, often we can have the case transferred to Judge Rowan. Now the reason that's valuable for you is we know her procedure. We know her clerk, we know what she wants, and every judge of course has unwritten ways they like things done, right? Second, we're there to mentor you. Unlike some of the other nonprofits in the city, when you come back to court, we're there with you. So I'm always standing in the well of the courtroom, and Judge Rowan and the government attorneys are very happy when you just simply say, Your Honor, may I confer with Professor Benson? That's my name, Professor Benson. <laughs> it's just, I'm Lenny to you, of course, but Professor Benson. And then you just turn around and we confer. And so if the vocabulary slips your mind or you're not sure what the judge is offering, I'm there to mentor you. If I am not there, one of the other senior volunteer attorneys who knows deportation procedure will be in the courtroom with you. All right, um, picture again of children on the train, children also in trucks. Very important, we've already covered this. Immigration court is a civil administrative proceeding, so there's no juries, there's no court reporter, there is an interpreter, there is a government attorney, there's an electronic digital audio recording that is made, and the government is represented by attorneys who work for ICE. Children are not provided with free counsel. All right, um, this is a little bit technical about what is actually happening at the border. Uh, most of the children are apprehended at the border. The Border Patrol complete a record of arrest or a warrant of arrest document. And they have an option of charging one of these three ways of removing someone. 
They can say, I'm removing you based on charges filed at the border. In theory, they could put the child in expedited removal. This is a procedure that came into the immigration law in 1996. And it says that anyone who arrives at our border without documents or who commits fraud or misrepresentation at the border, so you could have a valid visa but you're lying and they believe you're lying, can be summarily ordered deported by the signature of two Border Patrol officers. This is the most, uh, the fastest growing way of deporting people. More people are deported through this procedure every year than actually in the immigration court. It happens at the airport every day. It has not been used against children, with the exception of Canadian or Mexican children. I know we didn't put the Canadian children there. It does happen occasionally with Canadians as well. Um, this may change. The McCain bill that was introduced this last week um, wants to authorize expedited removal. This is more administrative policy. Personally, I think it would violate the due process clause because how can you know you had a competent interview with the Border Patrol officer when there's no representation at the border? How can a child be assumed to be able to articulate the circumstances of their arrival? Um, but Congress has insulated expedited removal from judicial review. And this has gone up to the federal courts a number of times. Um, I know you live in the United States, you think of course you get to go to court. No, you don't. Um, so if, if this is the path that President Obama or Congress pushes us toward, expedited removal for children at the border, I believe there will also be constitutional litigation about whether that's a sufficient procedure. But it may be very difficult um, context to litigate from because this is an area where there's no judicial review of the decision to expeditedly remove. Removal based on charges filed within the interior. Sometimes children are apprehended within the United States. So they got to a bus stop in Phoenix, or they were working and there was a workplace raid in Kansas, or they were picked up on a truancy or subway um, fare jumping charge, and they ended up ultimately in a removal proceeding. Um, so when you get a case from us, one of the first things to be thinking about in the case is, what's the nature of these charges? Is this someone being charged with not having any documents and being inadmissible, or is it someone who is apprehended in the United States and is being told they have to be deported? And that just is procedurally the burdens of proof are different. It's kind of an advanced topic. We are having an advanced topic training on um, the evening of the 29th, which is a Tuesday night, on immigration court procedures. And one of the things we're going to start talking about in that training is objecting to the charges the government makes. But in the vast majority of the cases that we see in Safe Passage, the government has properly charged the child with being someone who has no documents and is removable from the United States, whether it's at the border or in the interior. And the lawyer concedes the grounds of removability and now seeks relief. This is an image of what it looks like in our screening room. This is the ceremonial courtroom in the immigration court. You see students, lawyers, and a young person being interviewed. Sometimes it's a group of three or four because you might have a relative there, at least for part of the interview, and you have a volunteer interpreter. Um, these interviews go about 45 minutes to an hour and a half, and we have a standardized questionnaire. After we've completed those interviews, the law students who are working in the project or the volunteer attorneys are asked to prepare a first assessment memorandum. You know, what do they think this child might qualify for? Is there any relief the child is available for? We're going to talk more about that relief the rest of the training. Um, we then, as the staff of Safe Passage, Guillermo Stamper, Claire Thomas, and myself, we review those memos. If necessary, we refine them, we add to them. Occasionally, we conclude we need to re-interview the child. Like just, it wasn't clear from what happened at the court. And then um, we will re-interview the child and augment the memo. That memo becomes your placement memo. So when you say, I want to take a case, we say, great. Um, here's a memorandum about this young person. The majority of the attorneys that we then asked to take on a case, usually ask us to meet the child again here at New York Law School in our Safe Passage offices. Um, sometimes it's late afternoon, early evening, occasionally even on the weekend, and uh, ask us as well to have a law student assigned to work with them on the case. And uh, that's because the law students want to do this work. There's several in the room right now. 
and they want to do this for a pro bono commitment themselves. It's not for academic credit, per se, that any of them are doing this. They're committed to the case in the same way you are. I think the pro bono attorneys really like having law students working with them on cases for a number of reasons. Law students, for example, can be good at getting you up-to-date research. Second, they can help build a relationship of trust and communication with the with the young person. I mean, I'm looking at Robert, who's an evening student here. Robert was able to successfully, just wave at everybody, Robert, so they know who I'm looking at. He was able to successfully build a relationship of trust with a teen who'd been pretty rebellious, um, raised by a, a mom and a grandmom, um, really not trusting of the attorneys. And Robert was able to just, like, sit with him and build a relationship with him, like, explaining why the lawyer's trying to help. You know, why he shouldn't listen to the community he lives in. Um, he just says, oh, just ignore all that immigration court. Um, working with a law student can give more time to the project and also give you a partner in your pro bono uh, work. So we do encourage that. Um, uh, it's not required. If you want to work on the case all by yourself, certainly you can do that. All right, this is going to be my last slide, so Claire, if you want to come up. You can't read this, right? Lots of little boxes, lots of words. But this is all the different forms of relief a child might qualify for. So in those screening interviews, we're not just looking just to see is the child eligible for something we're going to spend a lot of time on, special immigrant juvenile status, or asylum. We're also going to talk about that. But some children have been victims of crime here in the United States, and they might qualify for a U visa. Others have been trafficked, and that's a T visa. We have found U.S. citizen children in our interviewing, and we have found children who have step parents who are U.S. citizens who could actually sponsor them legally, but the family didn't know that. And so our screenings are very thorough to the best of our ability to evaluate every single possible option. And so doing this work, although the majority of the cases fall into SIJS, Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, and Asylum, there are other issues that do come up, and we have ex expertise and experience in all these other areas of immigration law as well. All right, so this is Claire Thomas. I'd like to do a brief introduction for you, because she's now going to do the substantive overview training on the forms of relief. Claire is um, an attorney who's been working with Safe Passage really only since um, the beginning of the year, and before that worked with the African Services Committee, a nonprofit in Manhattan, at the northern part of Manhattan, that works primarily with the African diaspora. 